Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. What I want to share with you today is a story of uh, Dallas, a young man from Texas, and uh, whose life eventually became entwined with mine. Here he is on a picture uh, playing with his two-year-old daughter, and the next thing he knows, waking up four months later after coma and multiple operations, is this, totally disfigured, not looking human anymore, but ultimately reaching what we can do with conventional reconstruction these days. The surgeon did a terrific job. He saved his life, and he actually got an award by the American Society for Plastic Surgery for best save of the year. But the patient has no eyelids, no nose, no lips. He cannot kiss his daughter or smile. And it's humbling to see that uh, we have not made enough progress over the past 80 years. Even though we can transfer larger blocks of tissues, we still transfer tissues that do not belong to the face, do not function like a face, simply don't look like a face and are derived from other parts of the patient's own body. What I wanted to do is try to figure out a way to really restore, to bring something new to the patient's lives that would really replace what's missing, perhaps moving from re reconstruction to restoration. And that's possible only by transplantation. What I wanted to do for Dallas and patients like himself is to literally take off the old of mask that covers non-human looking appearance and then take from a brain dead donor a tissue that, al that allows to collect skin, nose, eyelids, but everything underneath, including the muscles, the vessels that keep it all alive, but also the nerves that can both power the muscles and make this face functional again, but also provide sensation and transfer it as one unit to Dallas and provide him with new chance in life. Now, why do we need a face, first of all? <laughs> and uh, there are something, some, some very unique features about a human brain, our ability to process face. And if I would flash any of these three presidents in front of your eyes for a few milliseconds, any one of you would immediately recognize them. And that's because there's something about our ability to, to perceive face as human because of the positions of the eyes, nose, and lips, the, the hard part of the central face that you really cannot restore or replace. Um, and there's a whole science behind it. But of course, face helps us to express ourselves, to help uh, express our emotions, our mood, and everything that goes along with it. Anatomically, it's a remarkably complicated uh, system of unique features in tight anatomic space. Muscles, bones, tendons, nerves, vessels, everything in synchrony along with glands and other things that help us to perceive the world. We harbor really all of our senses on the face, including vision, and we need eyelids for protection of the eyesight. We need nose to be able to bring the stream of air to uh, centers that allow us to smell. We have a tongue that allows us to taste, of course, hearing, and there is some aspect of uh, sensation in the, in the face as well. The ability to detect the shape and, and color and temperature of food, be able to speak, etc., etc. And it's very complicated, but it's doable to transplant a face based on certain principles that I will share with you later on. Now, before I could take you on the journey, what it takes to set up a program and develop a new, unique operation, I want to share with you a few of the enablers that are really, that are really necessary and mandatory to have in place. First of all, uh, we had to conquer the technique of microsurgery. And here on this picture, you see the size of the needle compared to penny. And you barely can see it with naked eye, but you can, under microscope, connect vessels that are tiny, as tiny as a few millimeters, sometimes less than a millimeter in size, and actually allow them to stay not only connected, but stay open and bring blood in, as well as take the blood out from the part that we need. One of the big hurdles in any of the transplants' lives and our patients' lives is the need for lifelong immune suppression. All of the patients that we have transplanted so far require, require medication for the rest of their lives with all their side effects and everything that goes along with it. And it's our patients that tell us that they really want to take it on, but it is something that we try to work hard to eliminate, reduce, or possibly completely get rid of one day in the future. This also brought the biggest controversy. Why or how can you put someone on lifelong immune suppression for an organ like face that is not life-saving? But I think, as you will see from some of the examples, um, I think it's well worth it, and our, our patients certainly think the same. The next thing was to bring together multiple uh, surgeons, physicians, and other uh, support staff 
from um, anesthesia, infectious disease, uh, transplant medicine, through nursing, uh, occupational physical therapy, social work, and nutritionists, everyone under the roof to collaborate and know what to do for this particular patient when, the, when our moment comes. And as you know, it's very hard to have few surgeons, and I know it very well, to have few surgeons in the same room and talk to each other. So it was an enormous task to put together. But as you can see, we were ultimately able to create a team that can work together, that can everyone can be replaced by another who can step in, who are remarkably skilled and talented physicians. And then the whole, all the pieces have to come together including proper selection of the donor and, and our collaboration and help with the New England Organ Bank. Then the actual preparation and, and transfer of the recipient, uh, the uh, logistics that uh, come along with uh, the actual operation, because we can keep that tissue that's removed from a donor only alive for four hours. So that's the window we have to put it back on on a new patient. Quite an undertaking. Now, how do you design an operation like this that's really unique in a way that there are not that many new operations these days. Pretty much everything has been invented. Uh, the way to look at the uh, human body is, can be done from various angles. And typically it's described as a skin, the musculoskeletal system, the air digestive system, etc., etc., cardiovascular system. But that's not, if you were a builder, that's not how you can put a human body back together. If you were to think about uh, actual building blocks and how you can transfer part of human body it is really a composite of skin, but also all the underlying structures based on one vessel that brings the blood flow in and one vessel that drains it out. And these fundamental building blocks are called angiosomes. And they don't live in isolation. They're connected by vessels that have reduced caliber, but can enlarge when needed, when the segmental or the feeding vessels are cut off. And they're called choke vessels. So what we had to do is design uh, an operation that would follow the principles and uh, be feasible based on essentially one or two vessels that we, could, that we could transplant. And this is a scan of our first patient. You can see on the left side is the actual three-dimensional CT of the bony anatomy. You can see the large hole where the upper palate should be, where the nose should be sitting, where uh, you should have your teeth. There's a big chunk of the bone missing, and of course all of it um, in front of it, all the soft tissues that are in front of the, the skull as well. And then on the right side you see uh, the computer manipulation that allowed us to uh, really detect what needs to be replaced, how much bone we have to bring from the donor, but also all the overlying tissues. And the overlying tissues are the ones that contain the muscles, the nerves, and all the other stru structures that I've mentioned. We have some very cool new technology that helps us to develop roadmaps and essentially guides us in dissection, helps to eliminate some of the unknowns in surgery, which is a huge thing. And in this case, you have, we have three-dimensional maps where it, they show us some of the target arteries. And here you can see the facial, lingual, and superior thyroid arteries, one of our common targets. And the resolution is so fine that we can see not only the arteries, but also the veins, and literally up front decide what we're going to find and what we're going to look for and where we're going to connect the part. So after that, our first patient from the man on the left side who had no upper palate, no nose, and essentially uh, missing large part of the cheeks and upper lip was transformed to a new man who can not only breathe through his nose, but he can feel he, when he scratches his nose or face, he can feel inside of his mouth and uh, he can smile and power his lips and be able to talk. It, it has, over the past two years, which it has been since his operation, has really transformed his personality. From a man that came and couldn't wait to get back to the shuttle and go back to his home, group home where he lives, he's someone that can talk about Red Sox for an hour in the office. <laughs> and he really is comfortable walking through the streets and uh, down the halls in the, in the hospital. Someone that really I did, could not recognize and profoundly continues to improve over the time. So I think, to sum it up, I think we have new, very powerful technology, but that reaches way past just facial transplantation and facial restoration. Certainly for face, at the present time, this probably should become standard of care, and we should, as we have shown safety and reliability, we should study the outcomes and make sure that we move forward um, and improve 
um, as well as make more efficient the surgical technique and all of it that goes along with the undertaking. But what we really need to solve is the immune tolerance and uh, reduce the immune suppression or possibly develop tolerance that will allow patients to live with new parts. It doesn't have to be just the face. Based on the angiosome blog, you could transplant any part of a human body that's missing. It could be arm, leg, hand. It could be any part you can think of. But we can't move forward until the immune suppression is solved, the immune tolerance is developed. And then uh, I think with this new truly restorative surgery, we may open a door to something what Joe Murray, as the first pioneer of transplantation, did when he transplanted kidneys in identical twins 60 years ago. And from a man, Dallas, who uh, was transplanted only a couple of months ago, we can return not only his human face and dignity, but we can return the daughter, her father. And I think, although it's not life-saving, this operation in many ways is life-giving. Thank you very much.